everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the SBK Betting Podcast, the first uh, podcast this year of April. Uh, we're coming into the spring season, and for this week, we're going to focus on both national hunt racing and flat racing. But great to see, and thank you to everyone who tuned in last week as one of our most popular podcasts ever really with the all weather championships and also a bit of the dubai world cup so we know that you enjoy your flat stuff so we're just going to temper both uh, enjoyment pl enjoyment levels and give you a bit of something for those that like the national hunt stuff because we saw the comments and i think a few people were a little put out so we're going to focus on kelso and kempton park um in the company of ross miller and tc uh, as always kelso we have um good racing um, we're sort of in a bit of a lull period before we've got Aintree next week, which is uh, our big festival with the Grand National coming up. But Kelso has put on a good amount of prize money and they've been rewarded with um, horses from this country and also Ireland as well. So as mentioned, the Mayor's Novice Handicap Hurdle we'll, we'll look at. We've got uh, 12 runners declared and Brucio tops it with stable companion Lily de Burley also in there as well for Stuart Crawford. Uh, Brucio far the best from a ratings perspective with a mark of 132 we've got some sort of more unexposed mares outside of it so i suppose we'll get cracking with our our resident national hunt expert ross miller um what do you make of i suppose this race and the, the card in general at kelso on saturday because probably targeted by a few that swerved the likes of cheltenham fairy house and maybe even Aintree. Yeah, I think you've got a lot of mares here in, in this race that perhaps, you know, weren't quite up to it to, to Cheltenham, probably aren't up to it. Aintree, this is this is a nice card. Bruzio, I mean, it's a bit after timing, but I did actually back her at Leperstown. I thought she was much better than, than the form line gave her credit for there. She went off a very big price. But subsequently, you look back at that race on Leperstown, not an awful lot has come out of it. The, the couple that finished in behind her have been well beaten since. Um I just wonder whether this mark and and particularly this big heavy weight on what's going to be uh, very testing ground is is perhaps going to make things difficult for her. Mare I like here, and I actually put her up in um, on the Tuesday podcast with the handicap movers and shakers. Is is strong Bell? She looked like a, a, a mare that was looking useful. I think she would have won on her second start at Catrick, but she came down at the last, and that perhaps knocked her confidence a bit because she was a bit disappointing in the next couple of starts. But at Bangor last time on heavy ground. She travelled like a really smart horse through the race, was much the best, comfortably accounted for Pitwood Road, who'd been sent over by Terence O'Brien from Ireland, had been really well gambled in the run-up to the start of that race, put her away by about five lengths. Um, looks like a decent piece of form. Pitwood Road has come out and won since. Gets a really lovely light weight here. I think it's 10 stone two. James Turner's going to try and take off another seven pound. I, mean, I don't know whether he had to claim actually the full seven. That would be a a devilishly light weight but regardless she's going to run off a very light weight which i do like on uh, heavy ground i think she's an improving filly i think she's better than her mark and now she's got that win under her belt and gone through the race nicely finished it off well i, I want to be with her i thought she was a a, a decent uh, looking mare going forward on, on testing ground in particular yeah that's quite right testing ground all over the country we've got race meetings abandoned this week just goes to show how much uh, unseasonable rain we're having and yes she's got that 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 tick against her with the ground perspective i suppose she just probably needs to raise her game in this kind of grade but uh, nigel twist and davis team still going strong um looks to be one of their best seasons for some time as he uh finishes out just the sole license holder before willie joins in uh so strong bell for for ross uh tc back into jumps mode what did you make of this is that was that stand up for you yeah, I don't know if I'm back into jumps mode or not. I think I'm just crawling my way through the rest of this season. Ain't sure will be a bit different, but the rest of it for sure. Just uh, doing it for the podcast purposes. I won't be having a bet in this race. I'm disappointed Dysar Enos isn't running here, given she was in the initial entries. It would have been good to see her, especially after uh, 11th hour scratching at the Cheltenham Festival. Um, as I say, I don't love this event. I, I think if there's one standout from a potential handicapping point of view, it's shake your tail feather for Dan and Harry Skelton. Now, the heavy ground is a little bit of a concern, but she was running OK on a penultimate outing where she was brought down at Doncaster on similar conditions. Uh, that was at the fourth last. So we don't really know how far she would have gone, how close she would have got. But she was traveling well at the time that she came down. And then last time she ran at Kempton and she ran very well, finishing second to a nice horse called Why Not for Henry Daly, who's won three of uh, her last four outings. 
Shaker Telfeather now gets in off uh, into a handicap company off an opening mark of 109. Debatably well handicapped based on what we've seen, especially given she's only had five starts and is likely to take a big step forward. As I say, ground is an issue. But when Dan Skelton's got runners this time of year, when he's looking for that trainer's title, you've always got to respect them. Yeah, I completely agree with you, actually. I found it, I took quite a few off this list based on one reason, whatever, a lot a lot with ground or slightly above this case that Ross has made about strong value does have the ground in her favour. I just don't know how good the form is compared to Shake Your Tail Feather. I think that she's, um, she looked like, she was really eye-catching last time. She's a, she's a mare that sort of started with humble beginnings. She was sent off at massive prices early on in the season when she was fourth at Taunton. I remember watching that race at 200 to 1. I thought, how is a Dan Skelton horse going off at 200 to 1? Um, but then she's clearly, um, they, they've given her some time and she's come back into herself, as you say. Ground, a question mark. Uh, despite running okay before being brought down at Doncaster. And Dan Skelton, as you say, select got a small but select team up at Kelso, got just them um, the four runners, but very much eyes on the prize. And he is keeping in mind the best races for the horses. He is wanting to win all of them. It's still a very tight um, lead that he has over his old boss, Paul Nichols. So uh, me and TEC hoping that he's going to have success here with Shake Your Tail Feather and Strong Bell, for Ross. Right, okay, we're going from Kelso, as mentioned, back to the all weather. And I have to say, I'm finding this much more interesting and exciting now. I'm getting my real um, momentum behind the all weather at present. Um, and as we have a bit of a lull before the Craven meeting and the, the best of the turf action um, starts again. But this card on Saturday, Tom, is a really good looking of really good looking event um we've also got great racing from chelmsford as well because we've got a road to the kentucky derby uh, qualifying race but the kempton card in general if you're all other fan and i feel like we've got quite a lot of all other fans from last week's podcast is one to really get your teeth into yeah this is a fixture I, I tend to visit every single year i think i'm going this weekend i don't know just yet but hopefully i will be there because there's a lot of top quality horses running the Rosebury Handicap, which we'll get stuck into in a minute, is a top quality event. And you've got all the leading jockeys buying one or two who are at Chelmsford, as you say. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really good fixture. I know people are putting the flat on the back burner after um, the Lincoln and then the big gap. But all weather championships last week was really good. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure most people did as well. Hopefully, Kempton can provide a few more exciting finishes. Yeah, certainly. Okay, let's get into it. We're going to start with this Rosebury handicap. It's one mile three. Horses rated 0 to 105. So these are good quality horses. Some of them might be just beginning off their year, um, coming off a break. Some might have already had some uh, spins around the all weather earlier on in this sort of winter period. And in general, I think a nice feel. Max 14 have, have turned up. Um, headlined by Old Horovian for Oshin Murphy. Andrew Balding's made a really good start to this new season. He comes here off a long break, last seen in a, a Group 3 last year. And so for John and Fabi Gosden was a winner uh, only a couple of weeks ago uh, at Wolverhampton and is, looks to be on the improve. And then you've got Chillingham for Ed Bethel, um, who doesn't send many horses to uh, Captain, it must be said. The likes of Laffey in here, we know pretty well. Um, Cannon Rock for James Owen, he doesn't have many um, of this ilk in here. But it's, uh, as I said, I'll come back to you, Tom, a good lineup of cl classy handicappers who might just become sort of fringe pattern horses throughout the course of this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Old Horovian, who's the favourite, was last seen in Group 3 company. He's only had the four starts, so he could definitely be uh, a, a proper group performer. In Tinso, it's always hinted that he's got the talent to progress and really fight at the top level, but we have, just haven't seen it in recent years. However, that comeback last time was very impressive at a short price. I love how he quickened off the turn. And in my opinion, he deserves to be the favourite in this race. Now, I'm not going to be selecting him, but I do think he's the most logical winner. Get your head around that one. Um, there's, a value, there's a point or two value uh, on his current price around 11 to 2, 5 to 1. So if you do like his profile, I'd suggest probably backing him now rather than waiting until Saturday. I, I think there's more value, however, in the each way market because this race is wide open. It's a big enough field and you're going to get three, maybe four places with some firms. I don't know. I think SBK may be offering four places. So I'm going to look at one at a double figure price and that horse is going to be Dream Harder, who actually finished behind in Tinso last time. And there were no obvious excuses as to why Dream Harder will be able to reverse the form. However, that was his first start for 195 days. 
Ian Williams likes to progress his horses through the year and target them at big prizes, especially in the handicap division. And I think Dream Harder would have just been teed up for this race. He wasn't given a very aggressive ride in the latter stages. It was very much hands and heels. And he was ridden plenty far enough back through the field, whereas Intinso was right up with the pace. So maybe things didn't go ideal for him, despite the fact he was beating a significant margin. He's 20 to 1 in this race. Ian Williams, as I say, will have progressed this horse at home, get him near enough fit, uh, 100% fit for this race. And I love the long home straight at Kempton for Dream Harder. He's very much a grinder. He wants to get into that top gear, but he doesn't have instant acceleration. So moving to Kempton is definite positive. He'll get, um, he'll be accelerating and moved up through the gears around the turn. And then you've got two and a half furlongs, three furlongs to really strike. Hopefully he can grab a place under Richard Kingscote. Okay. And in terms of the draw, we know that being wide historically hasn't been great, but I've seen, and you've watched Kempton as much as anyone else, that sometimes it's not always a negative. Do you think that we have to, we, we, we over indulge in the fact that being wide at Kempton can be a real, you know, sort of fall bearer, because I don't know if it necessarily is, especially in a race of this distance. 100%. I mean, Wolverhampton and Lingfield, if you're stuck wide, almost impossible to win. Kempton, I don't think it's the same by any means. Look, actually, if anything, if you can get into a race where there's decent pace and therefore the field is relatively strung out, the field is relatively strung out, you can sit too wide on the turns and then you've got the advantage of being on the outside on the home straight, which is a big advantage. If you cut to the inside, the surface is deeper. It's very difficult to pick up ground. We do see the odd horse use the cutaway and, and you know, cipher up the inside against the rail and win. But generally, you see outside closers come out on top at Kempton. And if you're drawn wide, yeah, it's not 100% ideal, but it could get you into a position to therefore strike in the, uh, in the home straight. So I don't mind stall 11 for Dream Harder, especially given he's a closer. If you're a forward going horse, there's plenty of other speed in the race. You may get stuck wide, but I think with him, he'll be able to get into a good position, maybe three quarters away down the field and use that to advantage later on. Okay, comprehensive. I think good, good value there for Dream Harder at 20 to one. For TC Ross, with all that in mind, is that is that swayed you? Are you on a dream well, harder? <laughs> Are you on the did, dream did harder? Not, did you not hear my sigh of relief when TC said that uh, he thought Intenso was the the logical um, selection, and it's it's the one I've I've come down on, of course. And I I have to say TC read my notes beautifully there. Um, <laughs> no. I, I, I thought there'd be a, a good chance that a lot of these are using this as a, as a springboard onto things. You know, they're, they're proven horses. They've got their mark. There's not an awful lot of juice in their mark. I wanted to try and find something that was, was progressive. And it was a, a fairly small, small bunch. And Intenzo is the one, as TC said, you know, on his debut, he was very impressive. They clearly thought a lot of him because his second start, he went into, into listed company and was, was disappointed. There's no doubt about that. And at York and at Ascot in particular, I thought he looked a little bit awkward and perhaps didn't have his mind fully on the job. I think it's no coincidence that he was gelded, then came back with that run at Wolverhampton last time, which was really impressive. Like TC said, he did quicken up like a smart horse. He's got draw one here. Holly Doyle will be able to go forward again. Um, I think they're going to want to try and build him into the season. They're not going to want to mess around. I think... Uh, He's got outstanding credentials and and could yet deliver on the promise that he clearly showed in his in certainly his first start and clearly the regard they've held him in. Yeah, look, a homebred of Imad Al Sagar, um, a son of Sayuni, who I think, as his pedigree suggests, was always going to improve as he got older, and he's definitely coming to hand. You know, he began um, sort of well midway point of last year. He was rated eighty seven, and he's now on a mark of ninety eight. So he's definitely that one who. You don't really know how, how good he is yet, but it definitely bred to be one of the, the nicest in this field. I, I think we'll all agree that the favourite is opposable uh, for, for many reasons. The time off, uh, the fact that we don't you know really know if this a rating of 93 is really reflective of, of, of what he is. Um, and I think sometimes you can get a little bit caught up with the fact of uh, when you see a horse that's bolted up in a lot of their novices. And I think that just might make life quite hard for them when they do go into handicaps. At least we know with the likes of Intenso um, what he is capable of in this kind of field. Uh, I'm a, I'm going to go uh, with a horse called Chillingham. Uh, coming off the back of a break, 135 days, I mentioned that Ed Bethel doesn't send many horses down from Midland to uh, Kempton. I think, I've, I think I saw it. Three runners he's had. Um, so... Just that goes to show he's probably just trying to find the right options for him. 
as Ross has mentioned, it might be just a platform, a springboard to something else. But I like the form with Pridwin from the end of last year, which has been uh, Frank, that horse has won recently. And Chillingham has always sort of promised a lot last year. I think he ran a brilliant race to be fourth to Vauban at Royal Ascot in the Copper Horse Handicap. And we know how strong that form turned out to be. Um, probably just found life a little bit difficult um, in some really uh, quality uh, handicaps last year. I think it'll be a big season for him five-year-old who showed a lot of promise in sort of lesser handicaps at the early part of last year but seemingly was able to run well off a break so I'm I'm confident that he's going to show a potential for Ed Bethel in uh, the Rosebury so we've all got a different slight differing I suppose um, Ross and TC's opinions sort of interlock so in Tinso for Ross uh, TC's got um, an each way selection with Dream Harder and I am for Chillingham uh, in the Rosebury but as mentioned plenty more um, uh, over the course of the card and over the course of the weekend but maybe I'll go to Ross first when we go to our naps and next best because it's not the Saturday that you're going to be focusing on at all and if you're listening to this before I think it is it's the first race at Weatherby tomorrow so you've got to be before 1.15 on Friday to be listening to this to get the full lowdown on how Roger's going to run uh, in, uh, tomorrow, second time out for you. Well, I, I think you might need to swim, Jess. They've got standing water there, um, an inspection at three o'clock. Um, uh, if, he, if it's on, he'll go. Um, he, he's been waiting to run. He's had a few entries that we've sided away from uh i think richard and i would both be concerned about the heavy ground i know it was heavy at stratford but he was the first race of their new season it hadn't been run on for three nearly four months and i think we probably got away with it he's a very nice action horse and i think if it's gluey holding ground that's not going to suit him but it does look like a a decent race um he's he's working well johnny burke went in and schooled him on uh wednesday morning that went well um so we're hopeful but we're still very much of the opinion that we don't quite know what we won at, at Stratford. You know, the, the handicapper took a fairly dim view of the race, to be honest. So we're hopeful, but not getting too carried away. But he's in, he's in good order and uh, he's jumping well, which is the, the really important thing. Yeah, as you say, 3 p.m. inspection today, Thursday recording. So we'll see what happens, but the best of luck. Um, we'll, we'll ask you for your nap and next best for Saturday while we've got you. So I've gone to Kelso because I think you talked to Mike Fall Fowler of, of the weather. Um, the 150 horse I'm really excited to see back is Crystal Glory for Nicky Richards. I thought he looked like a proper graded chaser in the making when winning on his chase debut at Hexham. He won by 20 lengths. It could have been 120 lengths. Beat a horse called Rapid Flight, who's now rated 136. Then went to a match race at uh, Haydock and pulled up and was uh, found to be laying behind. It's obviously been away now for 400 and something days, um, but he returns here. He's five pound lower over hurdles than he is over fences. So he's 133 over hurdles. Ran really well in that competitive three mile uh, handicap at Aintree uh, two years ago. Um, the ground there was probably a bit too lively for him. He, he'll cope with this soft, heavy ground. It's likely to be three mile, two firms would be an ideal trip for him. You have to take fitness, you know, on on trust. It might be that he's not quite ready, but I think Nicky Richards, with a horse that's gone lame behind, is not going to want to to stress this horse. I'm sure he's going to be fit to do himself justice, and I hope he goes well. I'm just excited to see him back because I think whatever he does on Saturday, he's a horse that you should certainly have in your tracker. He's a really exciting horse going forward. He'll he'll win a a bunch up north next season over fences. I'm sure of that. So he's my nap. Then the next best comes in at three o'clock. Uh, Stuart Crawford uh, does really well sending horses over to Scotland to the likes of Kelso and Air. And I like Bally Goose right down the bottom of the weights. Um, he was impressive on his on his chasing debut over two mile four. Um, jumped very soundly, stayed on very well. He's a bit of a big gawpy horse and I think he idled a little bit. Um, and then he lacked the pace next time to cope with Trapane Law. He dropped back to two miles. Um, he came off 10 lengths worse there. But Trapane Law's rate 138. I think that gives Bally Goose an attractive looking handicap mark. I think he'll stay this trip. You've got to put a line through his last run. But I thought he got a very negative ride on that occasion. And it was often him jumping quite poorly. And he then made a very bad mistake, which cost him all chance. Um, I'm not, there's no jockey decked up yet. He's only got 10 stone two. So that'll probably limit the jockey pool a little bit. 
it's a question whether he'll stay, but everything he did over two mile four in his first start, to me, suggested he's a horse that will just gallop all day long. So he's the next best in the three o'clock. Nap for Crystal Glory. Looking forward to seeing him back. And Bally Coos in the three o'clock, both at Kelso for Ross. Wouldn't be surprised if the, both of the selections are at Kempton for, for TC. He'll be hoping to attend in person himself. So if you're a Kempton follower, you've got to listen to this now. Only two bets, actually. It's probably going to be my only two bets on uh, on Saturday. Maybe I'll bet Dream Harder in the race we discussed earlier in the Rosebury. But these two are the only two I'm going to play. And then none of them are bankers. I just think they're value plays. So they're interchangeable nap and next best. No, not one that's more competent than the other. Um, both at Kempton, as you say, my nap will hopefully be a bigger price than the next best. And that is Desert Cop in the 455 for Andrew Balding and Oshin Murphy. Now, this son of Oasis Dream ran extremely well in two starts here at Kempton as a two-year-old. And I love course form, especially earlier in a horse, early in a horse's career, because then you can easily expect improvement from that form. But as a two-year-old, he showed a high level of ability on this circuit. He finished second in a maiden, then he won uh, in emphatic fashion. He had a break. And then Andrew Borden, as a three-year-old with this horse, thought we're going to target him at some lofty prizes. They even went to the Group 1 King stand, where he ran a phenomenal sixth behind Brad Sell. Now, when a horse, a young horse with limited experience goes to a race like that and they run out of their skin with a huge career best, it can often put them over the edge. And the rest of last year was a bit of a write-off for him. He ran okay on one occasion. The other starts were pretty below par, including at this venue where he was six of six uh, on his last outing behind Mischief Magic. Mischief Magic, who, by the way, is running at Keeneland for Charlie Appleby on Saturday. Watch out for him in the Shaker Town. Um, Desert Cop then has now coming back, but he's coming back off a handicap mark of 97, which I think is very fair given his run in the King's stand. If he's progressed, which I anticipate he will have done, like most of Andrew Balding's horses do, then he should go very close. I am concerned about the draw. I know earlier I said a wide draw is not bad, but over six furlongs, still 12 isn't ideal. Hopefully he can get a good position. If he doesn't, it's probably game over. If he does, I think he'll be a big player in the finish. My next best is going to be shorter in the market. That's Novell Legend. In the 3.15 at Kempton, James Fanshawe horses have kind of been bubbling under the surface. He hasn't had a winner for a while, but lots of them have been finishing fourth and fifth, and they've been big prices, not anticipated to win. So I think he's going to really strike with some of these horses soon. And hopefully Novel Legend will be one of them. Um, this race is competitive, but he gets in off top weight as well. I think he's going to thrive this year over the longer trips. Last season, he showed a liking for this venue with a cosy success at Kempton uh, on his reappearance. Followed that with a six-length romp at uh, Newbury. Then he just kind of contested class two handicaps that were too competitive for him. They actually sent him to a group one at the end of the year as well. Very similar profile to Desert Cop in that regard. And James Fanshawe is not a trainer that puts horses in the top level for no reason. If he thinks this horse can contest a group one, he probably can contest a group one. So on his comeback with a good record fresh, hopefully another legend will run well in the year 315. Okay, yeah, I agree. I was at, at Kempton on Monday and I saw his horse Al Amim in the paddock, backed it, came fifth, as you say, that kind of ilk, but looked spectacular in his coat. They look wonderful. They've really they really got them in a good place and they really deserve to to get a win because as you say, they're just sort of hitting the crossbar. But that's probably one of their nicest horses, novel legend legend that will be out at Kempton this weekend. So thank you um to TC Desert Cop cop to add to that some really interesting selections i'm at kempton as well i find it really difficult to pin down my my nap i i could have had a few um i do like capulet who's in the he's in the chelmsford um uh, conditions race the, the kentucky derby uh, uh points race but I, I think he'll be extremely short and i'd imagine notable speech might be as well um in the 425 the condition stakes at, at kempton as he deserves to be he beat the horse that i tipped up last week cuban tiger um who obviously went on and won so the form has been franked i think that this horse is likely to take a hell of a lot of beating um in a in a race where there is depth with Valvano the the horse that really catches the eye but he won on heavy ground at Nottingham he'll have to face con different sort of conditions on on the all weather surface but notable speech has done it twice at Kempton and I just really like his attitude and and uh, the potential he possesses so notable speech is my nap and then I'm going to take TC on at my peril in the 455 
because Richard Hughes cannot do anything wrong at the moment. Anything he's running, I'm following. I do like a horse of his called Les Bleu that's running earlier on in the card, but that's in a five-runner race. So I went for Nebworth who you can't knock his consistently. He's a really likeable horse. Wherever he turns up, he runs well. He does it on your weather and on the turf. He did so um, at Doncaster on the, the Lincoln meeting only 13 days ago. He has gone up in the handicap. He's got Ethan Jones on board, who's a very good claimer of seven pounds. And I just think that he's a, a horse that always will pitch up it in a race like this over this kind of distance. And as I said, Richard Hughes was firing at all cylinders, especially at Kempton. So Nebworth will be my next best on a, a great day. I'm going to really look forward to this. Um, Thank you to TC and to Ross. Uh, best of luck if the weather um, does not uh, cause foul for uh, weather be to be on for Roger, for Ross. Um, enjoy Captain TC. And uh, all that's left to say is that all new SBK users, because there might be a few of you after all those um, that tuned in last week, you'll get £30 in free bets when you sign up and bet £10 for the first time. Head to SBK for lots of other offers and promotions throughout this weekend. And we will see you next week with an entry special.